The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. They say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but does that apply to our homes and families as well? Hello and welcome to the program Words to Live By. In this series of programs, we are examining the home and the family. And while this topic is too broad and vast for us to be able to cover every scenario or potential idea for discussion, we do hope to give you God's instructions for the home and family and thus give you words to live by. You can then take these words and use them as your rules and guidelines to follow when making decisions about your own situations regarding the home and family. In reality, the home and family are under attack today. As we have begun to see in our previous programs, there are those who would dismantle the home and family by breaking down God's plan for marriage and God's appointed roles for us in the family and home. We continue looking at threats to the home and family with this lesson called, How to Avoid the Breakdown of the Home. Gary Colley will be leading us through this lesson. This will be a two-part lesson. In the first program, Gary will talk about some preventive measures about marriage. With the right prevention measures, we should be able to help avoid the breakdown of the home. These can be measures that we take before we are married or measures we take while we are married. Pay close attention to the different pieces of advice that Gary will give. And then in our next program, Gary will talk about how a study of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 will help our marriages. This is the chapter that describes the characteristics of love. It describes how someone who loves another will really think and act. We invite you to open your Bibles and study along with the program today. Let's continue our current lesson in the category of lessons dealing with threats to the home and family. Open your Bibles with us now as Gary Colley leads us in our study called How to Avoid the Breakdown of the Home. I am to speak today on how to avoid the breakdown of the home. And indeed, as we've already learned through so many lessons today, the Bible has the answer. Indeed, in John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to those Jews that believed upon Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. In Romans 15, 4, He said those things which were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. In Genesis 2, 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Many are troubled in their homes today, and I wish that we had a magic wand that we might wave over them sometime to help them do different in their homes. It's not a matter that the God of heaven has not revealed the right ways. It's not a matter that He has not given us everything that is necessary to make our homes what they ought to be and to be happy. In fact, he always didn't like that which was not happy, that which was not successful, and he always recommended what we needed. But too many people aren't listening to the Lord. They are not studying to show themselves approved unto God, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our grandson came to us recently and said, Paul, Paul, do you have any suggestions about marriage? He had just recently married. And I told him, yes, I had a few. Number one, if you can't always marry a Christian, and he had done that. And number two, always remember that it's not a 50-50 proposition, but it is a 70-30 proposition. You give 70, you expect 30, and it'll always work out for you that way. And then third of all, don't let divorce be a part of your vocabulary. Brother Elkin spoke in such a fine way just a moment ago about those things, and certainly you've heard it throughout the day. Indeed, from the beginning, marriage was and is the ordination of God. Genesis 2 and 3 give us that account of how this all came about. 
And indeed, it's a wonderful thing to know that he not only ordered the marriage relationship, but also government and also the Lord's church. And we've heard some wonderful lessons along that line today. But in summation of the authority of God and Christ, I believe I would say it simply says, leave, cleave, and of course, become one. Leave mother and father. That's a big thing sometimes. It's hard to do that. Hard for people to get away from mother and father and the home they've known for so many years. Cleave, of course, is that which means a husband to his wife and a wife to her husband. They are to cleave together as if they're glued and nothing is to come between them. They're to become one in aim and purpose and design. They're to be one in life. They're to be one in the marriage relationship and that's one of the greatest blessings that's ever been known to man. God certainly knew what he was doing when he provided man with a wife. But you know also that we should be careful and prayerful about who we choose to be our life's companion. That's not a light thing. It's not something that we can pass over lightly. But it is something we should think about prayerfully and carefully and indeed do that best to our, to our ability to do that only, which is in harmony with God's will. One man for one woman for life will bless you physically, mentally, and spiritually. And there is not a need in the world why anything should come between you and your mate. Now, it's always in line for us to know that though there are many jokes about marriage, it is not a laughing matter. It is a work. It is an important thing. And not because we just uh, think it is, it's because it is. The greatest blessing to man in life is to have a wife, to walk by his side. And it's only a curse for man or woman when either of these in this relationship either abuse it or ignore it. And if they do that, then it's not going to be happy. The fact of the matter is, one or both parties must be faithful unto God if they want it to succeed. Just as the farmer realizes that not only is planting necessary of the seed, but cultivating cultivating of that crop, and so is marriage. It is to be cultivated, and attention is to be given to it on a daily basis. We never get beyond our need to cultivate our marriage. It is never out of order to say, I love you. It's never out of order for you to encourage your mate. It's never out of order for you to hold her hand or she to hold yours. No matter where you are, you belong to each other. You're married. And so it was ordained from the beginning of time because God saw that man was alone and lonely and needed a help meet in his likeness. It is not good for man to be alone. Here is a lifetime companion, God says. Woman filled that very need, didn't she? Completely. And of course, it is therefore intended to be a permanent relationship, as we do say in the marriage ceremony, till death do us part. Now that day will come. But marriage is to be a planned union. I don't mean just planning by buying the rings. That's important, all right. It's not just planned by where we're going to have the wedding. It's not just a plan about the flowers or about the preacher or about the pictures or about the honeymoon. All of that is pre-cooling or going before the marriage relationship. It's sad to me that many discuss those things that don't discuss how they're going to use their money how many children they'll have in the family, how they will give to the, themselves to each other for the lifetime companionship of each other. Now this relationship, of course, is ordered by God. It is endorsed by Christ. It is instructed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is to be seen as a spiritual institution. It is indeed that sacred institution. And it is a relationship that is to be made by two very mature individuals. It is not for children. Mature thinking and mature plans and mature designs and desires must enter into this relationship. Nothing else will work except that. And a new home is formed uh, separate from the home of mother and father. That's what Genesis 2, 24 says. But Matthew 19 and verse 5 also says the same. And the vows taken in that marriage ceremony must be taken seriously. They must be those which are respected and revered and remembered. And nothing, no one, 
should be allowed to come between a man and his wife, not even a mother-in-law. And I'm sure there are no mothers-in-laws in this audience who would try to come between a man and his wife. But it has happened, hasn't it? And in the world, oftentimes it does happen. But these vows that we make in the marriage ceremony are solemn promises. They are solemn pledges, not just words without meaning, but they are to assure our love and our fidelity for each other as long as we both shall live. That's very important, isn't it? And we need to take a good look at those vows. I'm afraid most people in the marriage ceremony never hear those vows. They're so interested in how they're looking. They're interested in what they're doing. But our vows are a confirmation of our word. And you know, a man whose word is not trustworthy is not to be trusted in anything. And these, of course, include our promise to live together after the ordinance of God, whether in sickness or in health. And oftentimes sickness does come before the relationship is broken. In joy or in sorrow, doesn't matter about which one as long as we realize that is our obligation. And furthermore, that forsaking all others, forsaking all others, we'll be faithful to each other, conducting ourselves in every respect according to God's law regulating marriage. You know, after God created Adam, the first anesthesia was used on him. He put him to sleep. And then he removed from his side a rib. And with that rib, he made woman. Woman, our womb man, came to be man's companion, came to be man's helper. And Adam's helpmate was created here from a bone close to his heart, as we've noticed already today, under his arm where he would protect and care for her. And there she stood when God got through creating her in all of her sweetness, in all of her beauty, in all of her mystical attractiveness. And man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Man and woman are made expressly for each other with all the beauty and perfection for this union. And I heard on the radio the other day, well, they were never married. Oh, yes, they were too. And God performed that first marriage ceremony. In Genesis 5, 2, he called their name Adam. And from that day to this, wives have always worn their husband's name. And that not because they just wanted to be different, but because they wanted to be obedient to God. Godly women do not object to that at all. Now, Jehovah intended for these vows to be unbroken. And these solemn vows spoken as we agree in marriage to each other, that in that ceremony, they should be deeply impressed upon our minds and never forgotten. And you know, marriage is not just a date. We need to teach our young people that. They seem to think that if this one doesn't work, well, I'll get another. And that won't be any problem. Ah, yes, it will. It's not just a date. It's not just a trial arrangement that's destructive to society and to individuals in particular. And it's not just playing house. Malachi 2.16 says, God hates putting away. God never did hate anything that was good. He never did hate anything that caused man's happiness. But God hates divorce. And if you do not believe that, wait till you get to the judgment. He'll let you know for sure how much he hates putting away except according to his rules in this matter. Adultery, of course, is that illicit sexual relations between one with another who is not your mate. And that's when the vows are broken. But it not only breaks the vows, it causes broken hearts in the minds of all individuals who are involved in that family. Matthew 19, 89, we've heard before, but it still reads the same. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered or allowed you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. From the beginning of time, creation, it was not so. And I say unto you, Jesus said, we're going to return to that original law. I say unto you that whosoever, that's a universal term, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. A lady came to me in Mark, Texas a few years ago, and she said, my, wife, my daughter and her husband have separated, divorced. And I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, she said, I'm not going to worry about it, because it's only written to the man that he can't put away his wife. 
I said, you need to turn to Mark 10 and find out it's not just the man. He saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. In Luke 16, 18, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. Well, she had not seen that verse. And I suppose others may not have seen it either. But you know Paul wrote by inspiration in Hebrews 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable. Marriage is honorable in all, that is in every respect, and among all thinking people. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But the whoremonger and the adulterer, God will judge. It's certainly true that marriage is honorable in every way. Right thinking people will uphold marriage. It's a sad thing in our nation that we even have leaders of our country who are wanting to destroy the marriage between a man and a woman. They want to put two women together or two men together. Never was that intended by God, and He will not approve it. And we need to be sure that we understand that. We need to have a respect for this as a sacred union, not just that which is a plaything. The ring placed upon your left hand and on your finger on your left hand should ever be a reminder to you of those vows that you've made. They should never be forgotten. I have promised something. Am I going to be true to my promise? Those promises, of course, to each other, before God and before human witnesses, they can't be forgotten easily, can they? Unless we intend to, unless we simply do not care. You see, God's answer to fornication was well, simply that those who committed that relationship against their mate and against their marriage should not do so. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and every woman have her own husband. Those things oftentimes cause difficulties, and they make a breakdown of the home. And that is so sad. But let's see some additional things that cause the vows to be taken in marriage to be broken. They're mentioned by Paul in answer to the questions the Corinthians sent him. You know, 1 Corinthians is an answer to those questions. The first uh, few verses, first few chapters of that book are indeed devoted to the things Paul had heard from the household of Chloe, that there were contentions among them. But then from then on, he was answering questions that they had sent to him. And one of those questions was, what about a husband and wife? And should they remain together if one is a Christian and another is not? Or should they remain married at all after they become Christians? Well, he said in verse 3 here of 1 Corinthians 7, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Due benevolence, yes, due affection. That's what that means. Due affection in the conjugal relationship between husband and wife. There is a practical thing that is given here that should not be forgotten. Oh, I know that some teach that celibacy is more holy. That is not having sexual relationships with each other as a married couple. Oh, it's more holy if you remain un, uninvolved in this difficulty, but it's not true. It's not true at all, though the Catholics so teach. Number one, we ought to both worship God together. That would help our marriage more than anything else. But then there's also that love that respect and purity of these vows and the appreciation which we're to show and the respect that we're to show each other and the kindness, these are contributors to the bond of marriage. And the word due, of course, expresses and reminds all of those sacred vows that we've taken when we promise to each other to love and to honor and to respect. And we ought to think on a daily basis how we can supply the needs of each other. Can I help you? I would be glad to if I can. That ought to be spoken by both parties in this relationship. And it ought to be a desire of ours to help and to be of help, especially in the life of each other. To ignore and withhold physical needs, of course, is to defraud. And if we defraud, that simply means we are not a bordering chip or not using the relationship as a bordering chip against what we want or what we desire but rather the needs for which we're responsible to our mates is a debt. And a debt, of course, to be paid. And it is that which we owe to them because of the vows, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5. 
But you see, love and trust are the cornerstones of a successful marriage. If there's not love there, if there's not trust there, then it's going to break apart and the breakdown of the home will come because no marriage can exist for long where love and trust are not there. It's so sad to see love in the scriptures not understood. It means interest and concern, doesn't it? If we love God, we have an interest and concern in his cause. If we love Christ, if we love the church, if we love our fellow man, if we love those in error, we have concern for them. We have an interest in them. Doesn't mean always that we approve their character, but we have a concern for their soul and their needs. And it is indeed the glue, the bond that holds marriage together. As long as love and trust grow brightly, it's going to be a success. When it goes down and love is not there, or when trust is not there, there's going to be great difficulties. We must be uh, always interested in making sure those things are present. And the only time that it should not be uh, that we would be together would be the time when for the sake of work or ex sickness or other ways, indeed, which we have both agreed on, that might be all right of our mate, but we're still faithful to our vows. But let me tell you something. In sickness, there's a great difficulty. That's when we are very vulnerable. It's very much so when our mate has to be away for us for a time we realize that there is no time that we can let our guard down. The devil's always there, isn't he? First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, your enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom withstand steadfast in your faith. And that's the answer to that, isn't it? But you know, the workplace presents a place where you could be doing things you shouldn't be doing and nobody would know about it. Even your mate might not know. But you know, God knows. Your fellow workers know. What a shame and a disgrace it is, but the workplace has become a place of dividing homes, oftentimes entertainments. Maybe the wife doesn't enjoy the entertainment the husband enjoys or vice versa. And because of that, there is an opportunity there to turn away from the family. And then, of course, there's family and friends may be very close to our family. And because of that, it may possibly be that we fall for one of those through a look, through a glance, through a flirt. Oh, yeah, it can happen. And it seems to happen so quickly sometimes when we're vulnerable, when we're lonely or when we feel that we're not getting all the attention that we need. Oh, I know in so close a relationship as marriage, there's always going to be temptations, and we're liable to fall too. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12 and 13, he said, Let a man that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as man can bear. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, will will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We should be ready at all times and know beforehand what we're going to do before the temptation comes. You know, good drivers, I may have mentioned this to you before, but they always look ahead down the road and they say, now, if that situation comes, what am I going to do? Where am I going? You need to decide that before the situation happens. The same is true with temptation. Before you're tempted, you ought to decide what you're going to do. You've got to decide how you're going to answer that. And if you'll do that, you'll be ready. Gary Colley has brought up several pieces of advice. One thing he mentioned was that it is better to marry a Christian. It is not a sin for someone who has never been married before to marry a non-Christian, but it will make the marriage more difficult. Imagine two people bound together, such as by a rope or cord. How easy will it be for them to work together when they have different goals of where they want to be? A Christian with a spiritual goal of heaven will be pulling in one direction, while an earthly-minded non-Christian will be pulling in a different direction. Two people going in two directions, yet bound together, is certain to cause some tension. Gary also pointed out that we should not expect marriage to be a half-and-half half or 50-50 arrangement. Instead, we should expect to give more of ourselves than that. Remember that the love in the marriage is to be a sacrificial love. We should not be in a marriage to see how much we can get for ourselves. Instead, we should be in the marriage to put the other person first. 
Remember that Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 states, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How much did Christ love the church? Well, enough to die for it. How much should husbands love their wives? Enough to die for them. In that case, would not this sacrificial attitude be seen in our everyday lives, even if it were not a life or death situation? Would we then not see the husbands sacrificing themselves on behalf of the wife in all sorts of things every day if they have that kind of love for them? If you did not get a chance to write down all the pieces of advice, just visit our website, www.truthfortheworld.org, to watch the program again. Well, even though we are looking at the physical home and family during the course of these programs, we must not forget to mention the spiritual family. The most important family of which you can be a member is the spiritual family of God. When we rebel against God's laws and do things our ways, it is sin, and the punishment for that sin is death or separation from God. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we see the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is because of Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life instead of the death that we deserve. Jesus, who is God, came down to earth and lived a sinless life and then gave himself as a perfect sacrifice of death to pay the penalty of sins for all mankind. Now, if we accept that sacrifice on our behalf and have our sins washed away, we can return to God's presence after this life is over. In fact, we can become one of God's children. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, we read that God has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. It was because of Jesus that the adoption into the family of God is possible for us. In order to accept the sacrifice on our behalf and wash away our sins, we need to follow God's plan of salvation. First, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for our salvation as a perfect sacrifice for sin. Next, repent of our sins, stop rebelling against God and be willing to follow His ways. Then confess our belief in Christ before others, simply stating you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Next, you need to be immersed in water, baptized, in order that you might wash away your sins. Just as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, so you too must die to your old way of sin, be buried under water, and rise to walk a new creature. Finally, live faithfully following Christ and His commandments. Have you done these things today? If not, why not take care of it and be added to the spiritual family of God? If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World. P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Day by day and with each passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause.